Hi guys. In this video, I'll prove the functional equation for the Riemann zeta function, which says that gamma of s over 2 times z of s over pi to the power of s over 2 is equal to gamma of 1 half minus s over 2 zeta of 1 minus s over pi to the power of 1 half minus s over 2. I will also be explaining why it's so important in its many uses. So let's get started. The proof I will use is from Wikipedia. First, the gamma function of z is defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the power of z minus 1 times e to the negative t dt for any z with real part greater than 0. This converges because of exponential decay. Now, consider gamma of z plus 1. This is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the z e to the negative t dt by the definition of the gamma function. We can now use this integration by parts formula here. And if we plug in f is equal to t to the z, and g is equal to negative e to the negative t, we see that our integral of t to the z times e to the negative t dt is equal to t to the z times negative e to the negative t evaluated at zero infinity, minus the integral of negative z times t to the z minus one times e to the negative t dt. But t to the z times negative e to the negative t is zero at both zero and infinity, so we can just ignore that term. And we can rearrange the other term to get z times the integral of t to the z minus 1 times e to the negative t dt. But this is just gamma of z. So therefore, gamma of z plus 1 is equal to z times gamma of z. Now let's consider the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the power of 1 half s minus 1 times e to the negative n squared pi x dx, where s has a positive real part. Then we can use the substitution u is equal to n squared pi x. So therefore, du would be equal to n squared pi dx. Now plugging these into our integral, we get the integral of u over n squared pi to the power of 1 half s minus 1 times e to the negative u du over n squared pi. We can expand this out to get u to the power of 1 half s minus 1 over n to the power of s minus 2 times pi to the power of 1 half s minus 1 e to the negative u du over n squared pi. But now, we can combine the n's and pi's to get that this is equal to the integral of u to the power of 1 half s minus 1 over n to the power of s pi to the power of 1 half s e to the negative u du. We can move the constant term outside the integral, and then we see that the integral is just gamma of s over 2 by definition. So therefore, our final answer is gamma of s over 2 divided by n to the power of s times pi to the power of s over 2. Now fix some number s with a real part greater than 1 and consider gamma of s over 2 times z of s divided by pi to the power of s over 2. By the definition of the Riemann zeta function, we can rewrite this as gamma of s over 2 divided by pi to the power of s over 2 times the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the s. We can move the sum outside like this, and now we can use our formula from earlier to rewrite this as a sum from n equals 1 to infinity of the integral of x to the power of 1 half s minus 1 times e to the power of negative n squared pi x dx. And because we have absolute convergence, we can switch the sum in the integral like this. Now, let's define psi of x to be the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of e to the power of negative n squared pi x. Then we can simplify our formula to this. Isolating the zeta function on the left hand side, we get that zeta of s is equal to pi to the power of s over 2 divided by gamma of s over 2 times the integral of x to the power of 1 half s minus 1 times psi of x dx. We will now prove an important formula called the Poisson summation formula and apply it to the equation we just derived. Let f be a Schwarz function, which basically means that it decays rapidly. We won't worry about the precise details of convergence. Let capital F of x be the sum over all integers n of f of x plus n. Note that capital F of x plus 1 is the sum over all integers n of f of x plus n plus 1. But this is the same as capital F of x, where we are just shifting our index by 1. So therefore, capital F of x plus 1 is equal to capital F of x. And so therefore, capital F is a periodic function. Since capital F is periodic, we can find its Fourier coefficients. The kth Fourier coefficient of capital F, which we will denote as capital F hat k, is equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x times e to the negative 2 pi i k x dx. We can expand capital F of x like this. Now we can switch the sum and integral since we assumed f behaves nicely. 
But now this is just the integral from 0 to infinity of f of x times e to the negative 2 pi i k x dx. But this is just f hat of k by the definition of the Fourier transform. So now we can just use the Fourier series of f of x to write it as a sum of f hat sub k times e to the power of 2 pi i k x. But from what we just found, this is just equal to the sum of f hat of k times e to the power of 2 pi i k x. Now, plug in x is equal to 0, you get that f of 0 is equal to the sum of f hat of k. However, f of 0 is just the sum of f of n by definition. So therefore, we have this equation. Now, we will evaluate an important integral that at first glance might seem unrelated to what we have been doing so far. Consider the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared dx. To evaluate this, we will be using a very cool idea from mathworld.wolfram.com. We can, of course, rewrite this integral as the square root of itself squared, like this. Now, we combine these to turn this into a double integral of e to the power of negative a squared plus b squared db dA. Note that we are integrating over the whole plane r2. Now, we can change to using polar coordinates r and theta. Then a squared plus b squared is equal to r squared, and so we can rewrite our integral like this. The outer integral is just equivalent to multiplying by 2 pi, so we can rewrite our expression like this. Now, one antiderivative to r times e to the negative r squared is negative e to the negative r squared over 2. So we can evaluate this at infinity and at 0 to find the value of our integral. Plugging these values in, we see that our expression is equal to exactly the square root of pi fix some value of x. What is the Fourier transform of the function f of n which we define to be equal to e to the negative n squared pi over x? Well, by definition, the Fourier transform f hat of k is the integral from negative infinity to infinity of f of n times e to the negative 2 pi i k n dn. We can plug in our definition of f like this. Now, we can make the substitution l is equal to n divided by the square root of x, and so dl will be equal to dn divided by the square root of x. Plugging this into our equation, we get that f hat is equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the power of negative l root x squared pi over x times e to the negative 2 pi i k l root x times dl root x. Now we can do a little bit of simplification like this and then like this. Now we can complete this square to replace l squared plus 2 i k l squared of x by l plus i k squared of x squared plus k squared x. And we can pull out e to the power of negative pi k squared x like this. Now we can make the substitution m is equal to the square root of pi times l plus i k squared of x. And so dm will be the square root of pi times dl. Now plugging this in, we get e to the power of negative k squared x root x times 1 over the root pi times integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative m squared dm. But we already found out that this integral was the square root of pi, which we saw earlier. And so we can just simplify it to this. The square roots of pi cancel out, and so our final answer is just e to the power of negative pi k squared x, square root of x. Okay, so now let's again fix some number x, and let's try to calculate the sum from negative infinity to infinity of e to the power of negative n squared pi over x. Let's just define f of n to be e to the power of negative n squared pi over x. So we're trying to calculate the sum of f of n. Now, Poisson's formula, which we proved earlier, says that the sum from negative infinity to infinity of f of n is going to be equal to the sum from negative infinity to infinity of f hat of k. However, we just showed in part 5 that the Fourier transform of f is equal to square root of x times e to the power of negative pi k squared x. So therefore, our sum from negative infinity to infinity is just equal to the sum of square root of x times e to the power of negative pi k squared x. We can factor out the square root of x like this. Now, recall from earlier that we defined psi of x to be the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of e to the power of negative n squared pi over x. So, our left hand side is just 2 times psi of 1 over x plus 1 because we're summing from negative infinity to infinity instead of just from 1 to infinity. Likewise, we can see that our right-hand side is just the square root of x times 2 times psi of x plus 1. 
Now, dividing both sides by square root of x, we get that 2 times psi of x plus 1 is equal to 2 times psi of 1 over x plus 1 over the square root of x. Now, remember that all the way back in part 2, we showed that gamma of s over 2 times z of s over pi to the power of s over 2 is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s over 2 minus 1 times psi of x dx. Now, we can split this integral into two parts, one part going from 0 to 1 and another part going from 1 to infinity. Now, we can take the equation that we have just proven from our last section here, and we arrange it like this. And we can plug this equation into the first of our two integrals, like this. And now we can simplify it a little bit, and then we can split the integral apart. So now we have a bunch of different integrals. We can again simplify the integrals to get rid of the square root of x's in their denominators. Now, note that of our four integrals, we can find antiderivatives for both the second one and the third one. Now, plugging these antiderivatives in and evaluating them at both 1 and 0, we see that these two middle integrals end up becoming 1 over s minus 1 and negative 1 over s, like this. Now, we can make the substitution u is equal to 1 over x, so du is equal to negative dx over x squared, which is equal to negative dx u squared. Plugging this into our first integral, we get the integral from infinity to 1 of 1 over u to the power of s over 2 minus 3 halves psi of u negative du over u squared. We can flip the limits of integration and simplify a bit like this. Now we can finally combine our two integrals into a single integral. Remember that psi of x decays extremely fast, so this integral will converge everywhere for any value of x. Also, we can quickly see that if we replace s by 1 minus s, this expression will stay the same. So it's invariant under changing s to 1 minus s. So therefore, we have shown that gamma of s over 2 times z of s divided by pi to the power of s over 2 is equal to gamma of 1 half minus s over 2, z of 1 minus s over pi to the power of 1 half minus s over 2, which is the functional equation of the Riemann zeta function. The functional equation is extremely important, and it has lots of different consequences. For example, if s is a negative even integer, then you can use the recursion for gamma that we proved at the beginning of this video to show that gamma of s over 2 is infinite. But the right-hand side is finite, and so therefore z of s must be 0 to keep the left-hand side from being infinite. So therefore, z of any negative even integer is 0. These zeros are called the quote-unquote trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function. There are many other uses of the functional equation. For example, due to the symmetry of gamma of s over 2 times z of s divided by pi to the power of s over 2, you can show that it must be real on the line of complex numbers with real part 1 half, which is called the critical line. This, in turn, can be used to determine basically the argument of the Riemann zeta function. Also, the formula can be used to show that all the zeros of the Riemann zeta function that are not trivial must have a real part between 0 and 1. There are lots of other very interesting applications, too. The functional equation is a starting point for a lot of very important math relating to the Riemann zeta function. Thanks for watching. Bye.